Hello everyone, thank you very much for attending our art cleaning info session on how to issue interviews. Here we have today Michael Tan and Ewongo Bassi to speak about uh, art cleaning interviews and also Ewongo her experience. So Michael Tan is uh, the program lawyer of the professional graduate and international programs at Osgood Professional Development. He does program and curricular development, admissions, academic advising, and more relevant to the session, he also helps people on preparing for interviews. Before joining Osgood PD, he completed his National Committee on Accreditation process in 2013. He was called to the Bar of Ontario in 2015. Michael is the Policies and Advocacy Director of the ITLNC Networks. Yongo Bassi recently obtained her Master's in International Business Law from Osgood Hall Law School. She is currently an art student with the Ontario Ministry of the Attorney General at the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services and Ministry of Infrastructure. Prior to joining the ministry, Elongo worked at Pro Bono Ontario Laws Help Center as a coordinator. Before moving to Canada, she worked as an associate in a full service law firm in Nigeria, where she represented clients in civil and criminal litigation, advised on corporate transactions, commercial leasings, and property developments. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here, and thank you, Michael and Elongo, for giving your time for us and our expertise. We we'll start with Michael, then I will give her uh, experience of the interviews, and then we'll move to question and answers in the end. Hi everyone, so thanks for the introduction, Priscilla. I'll try to keep my portion to about 30 minutes so that we can keep um, getting insights from Onwongo as well as leave room and time for all of you to have questions. Um, hopefully you guys have some questions, which would be really great. I'm just gonna share my presentation now. Um, so for those of you who haven't attended any of the ITL NCA Network events, hopefully this is going to be enlightening for you. Um, and the ones that we've had from before are recorded and are available on our website. The last time we had these sessions, I also started off with exactly this slide. And I think it's really important to just remember that you're not at a deficit being an internationally trained lawyer is something you should be very proud of. Um, and it's something that you should see as a value add to yourself and to whoever else you're applying to. And so I want you to have a bit of a change in mindset because there are statements that I hear all the time from internationally trained lawyers that I'm just not as competitive as a Canadian student or I need Canadian experience in order to be competitive. Those are absolutely just false. Uh, you're just less familiar with the process here. And the practice of law and the skills of lawyering that you've developed in all the different jurisdictions that you come from are relevant here and important here and are the exact same skills that lawyers here need to have. So make sure you value that because if you don't, and you're going into these interviews and interactions with a negative mindset of that, you're gonna present yourself as less than. And I really want everybody to put their best foot forward. I want everyone to be proud of their achievements and accomplishments and their experience so that everybody who meets you realizes how impressive all of that stuff is. Um, and I really do want you to think you are an advocate for yourself. Right? No one's going to get you these jobs but yourself. No one's going to impress other people on your behalf. You're the one who has to do it. And if you're the lawyer or the law student or the articling student um, that they're looking for, you need to be an excellent advocate for yourself because how else is any employer going to trust you or any client going to trust you if you can't advocate for yourself? There are going to be some cultural differences. So some of you might come from jurisdictions where interviews aren't even a thing, or it's all in who you know, or it's all in what schools you came from. And while some of that is important here, the most important thing is being able to translate the amazing caliber of experience that you have, the amazing caliber of education that you have, and why it's an asset to people here. So please do keep these things in mind as I go through my presentation. So what's the purpose of an interview? Yes, they're looking for hiring somebody. They're looking for a summer student or an articling student or an associate. Ultimately, they're a business. So 
every law firm, every organization, they're run like an organization, a business where they want the best people, the best workers, the most excited, intelligent people because they want to add to their team the best possible people who can contribute to what our goals in this organization are. You're going to hear a lot about fit. I don't personally love that word, but it is a word that a lot of um, recruiters use. And all they mean when they're talking about firm fit or cultural fit is that they're looking for people who are like them, equally passionate about the things they do, equally excited about the types of work that they do, and that if they were sitting in an office with each other for 12 hours a day or you know, 18 hours a day before an m and closing or before a huge litigation trial, that you like each other, that you're in the same office and that you are a part of each other's lives and that it's somebody who they want to be around. So that's what they're looking for. They're looking for somebody to add to their team and to really be a part of their team truly. They're hoping to get to know who you are. Ultimately, when they're looking through all of these applications that they've had to sort through, everyone's intelligent, everyone has a couple of degrees, everyone has legal training of some sort, whether it's a law student or legal practice experience. And so there's already a base standard of education and experience that a lot of the applications come through with. What they're trying to see is, do you have passion and excitement for the things they do? Are you excited about what that firm does and what, what they're involved in? And they're also hoping to see, can you stand out? Can you represent and advocate for yourself and stand out amongst everyone else that they're interviewing? They want to see that you understand the firm and what they do and why you are a good fit for them. And so as you're preparing for these interviews, make sure these are things you've thought about. Why am I a good fit for them? Why, why am I similar to some of the lawyers there? What do they do that I'm so interested and passionate about or can bring the skills I have from my previous experiences to? Again, you are applying for a law student position or an articling position or an associate position, you need to be a good advocate, right? If you can't advocate for yourself in these interviews, how are you going to advocate for our clients? And because they're a business, it's a, they're looking for a return on investment. It's absolutely true that it takes time and money and energy and resources to train articling students and summer students and even juniors. The thing, uh, you know, you know, a statement of claim that takes me maybe five minutes to write is going to take a student who's never written a Canadian statement of claim maybe two hours to write and then they're going to submit it to their senior and I'm going to have to sit there and like review it and try to give you feedback and try to explain why this works and why this doesn't work and then you're going to go back and redraft it and over that entire process both you and that lawyer might have spent you know four or five hours on that thing that that lawyer could have done on their own in five or ten minutes and so they know that hiring a student is about training they're hoping to see through that process of training are you going to be a good fit for the firm are you going to be one of their people so that once you are billing out properly and uh, representing on files and appearing before court that that investment is going to come back to them. That investment in time and energy and devotion to the firm is going to come right back to them. But remember, interviews are both ways. It's not just what they're looking for and hope, hopefully that you're a good fit for them. You have to see, are you, is the firm a good fit for you? If the interviewers are being really antagonistic, or really cold, or really rude during the interview, do you want to spend the next 10 months with these people? Are you going to be okay sitting in an office with these people? So I understand there's a lot that you feel like is riding on this, right? You need this job, you need this articling position, you need to get called to the bar. I'd like you to think what you most need is an amazing career. 
and people who are supportive and people in the legal community and in the profession that you trust and people who you're going to find are your own community of people. And so the purpose of the interview is also for you to see, is this the place I want to spend the next 10 months or potentially five or six years? Is this some place where you can see yourself growing and developing into the lawyer you want to be? And another thing to think about, and hopefully you've done this already, and I mentioned this in the last um, presentation about job applications, is what are you hoping to get out of these experiences? And make sure that it's more than just what every other student is looking for, because that's not going to help you stand out. Every student is looking to be called. Every student is looking to learn more about different areas of law. Every student is looking to get more experience. And so you're applying to them and saying, I, I'd like to learn, I'd like to get experience. Of course, every single other applicant is also looking for that. What is the bigger picture? What is your end goal? What are you working towards? And how does this opportunity fit in with that long-term goal? Because in an interview, if all you say is, I'd love this opportunity to learn, every other person they're interviewing also wants to learn what makes you unique and special. So think beyond just, why do I want this job? It's not just to get called. It's not just to learn a specific area of law. It's not just to get experience. You could get that anywhere. What is it about this firm, this opportunity, these people that matter to you? So what are interviews like? So I know this is predominantly about an articling interview, but I'm going to cover all of these, these things are coming up. Um, so OCI interviews, they're very structured interviews. They are 17 minutes, usually about 15 to 17 minute long interviews. And so understandably, you're not going to be able to cover very much. But the OCI interview is an initial step in determining whether or not you're going to get a longer interview later on in hopes of getting a second, a second year summer position. Articling interviews are the interviews for articling positions. You might also end up having some LPP placement interviews, and they'll be relatively the same in terms of process and feel. Uh, those tend to be longer interviews and will be dependent on the specific firm as to what the structure and format of those interviews are going to be. Uh, and it will also depend on whether or not they're public sector or private sector. Private sector interviews tend to be more about what I was just talking about. They're trying to figure out if you're a good fit for them. They're trying to get to know you as a person. They're trying to figure out if you're a good fit for them in the amount of time that they're going to try to interview you. They might have you cycle through a bunch of different interviewers, or they might have a structured articling recruitment committee that is interviewing every single person. The larger the firm, the more structured that process is going to be. So the large multinational firms, you might have an HR person or you might have um, uh, an articling recruitment committee where they're asking everybody the same set of questions where they're all taking notes and they're basically trying to compare everybody that they've been talking to. Um, more mid-sized firms, you'll find that those, those interviews might be a little bit more flexible. It might not be a set number of people who are interviewing you. It might be whoever's free that day in the firm who's looked at your resume and they bring uh, those people together to interview the different people. Uh, and at small firms, there's really no specific guidance and so it really just depends on the firm and hopefully they'll let you know you know who you might be meeting with and how many people you might be interviewing with it might just be with your principal it might just be with the partner of the firm so there isn't as much of a structured process because smaller firms don't have the same resources to have that sort of student recruitment um, process in place or a, a hiring process in place but again, the end goal of the, those private sector interviews is about trying to get to know you, 
So you're going to find that the questions are a lot more about who you are and why you're interested in the job and things about your experience. And they're going to go through and talk, uh, want you to talk about sort of your unique experience and education and, and why you think you're a good fit. Public sector interviews are a very different beast, and I'm sure Anwongo is going to be able to talk about that, maybe Priscilla as well. Um, but public sector interviews, there isn't as much of an emphasis at all in your own personal uh, characteristics and personalities. The public sector hiring process, they want it to seem much more objective. And so in order to do that, the interviews are much more substantive in nature. It's not about who you are, it's about who they are. Do you know who they are? Do you know what their office does? Do you know the legislation that that public sector office deals with? The regulations, the bylaws, the case law that they work with? Do you know how they're structured? Do you know the different types of people who are in that organization? And it's about studying. You actually have to study for public sector interviews because depending on the department, they might say, come 15 minutes before the interview, we're gonna give you a set of questions that you have to prepare for. And it's basically an exam almost where you have to prepare your answers and then go through each of those questions one by one. And in those uh, interviews, your interview is going to be with maybe several people, a panel of people, and all of your answers are graded. And every individual gets asked exactly the same set of questions. And ultimately, the people who get asked back are the people who get graded the highest on these questions. It might be you come 15 minutes before, or it might be um, you get an hour to prepare while you're there. You might get instructions about you have to prepare a presentation on a specific type of topic. So the substantive nature of the public sector interviews varies differently uh, from the private sector ones where it's less about the area of law, it's more about who you are. And so that's really the difference. In private sector interviews, have you thought about yourself? In public sector interviews, have you thought about them and who they are? In the private sector interviews, also make sure authenticity is important. You're trying to be a lawyer. Lawyers are really good at figuring out if you're telling me the honest truth or you're telling me an answer you want me to hear. So think about being authentic in your answers, especially for questions like, what are your greatest strengths and weaknesses? Everyone in terms of their weaknesses, they always want to say, well, should I just tell them I'm a perfectionist or that I'm willing to work until the late hours of the day? And one of the things I often tell people in mock interviews is think about what that's telling an employer. That's telling an employer that maybe you have no self-awareness of your own flaws. Maybe you haven't worked on anything or been self-critical and tried to improve yourself in any way. Um, or for example, you know, students who say like, I'm willing to work until late hours to get things done. Well, that just says that there's a potential that this candidate might burn themselves out really early on. So you always want to think, what is, what is this answer going to show these potential employers what I know about myself and what I know about um, the work that I'm going to get into? A huge difference also between private and public sector interviews is the scenario questions that you get asked. So in private sector interviews, you're going to be asked what's called behavioral based questions. And these are hypothetical or potentially um, past experiences that you've been a part of where you're addressing a specific scenario and how you dealt with it. In public sector interviews, you will also have those sorts of uh, questions, but they'll tend to be based on professional ethics or professional regulations. So situational uh, uh, hypothetical scenarios or past scenarios you've been in that touch on or that um, you've had to deal with certain ethical or uh, regulatory, uh, professional regulatory issues. So I'm going to go through behavioral based questions uh, a little bit later and how to answer those. Um, those will also apply for the ethical based questions. When you're preparing for these interviews, though, really think about 
what you said in your application materials? Did you create a narrative about yourself, about who you are, why you're interested in this firm, why you're interested in these areas of law? Because you want to refer back to that again. You want to bring up points you've brought up before, and you want to come off as a consistent person presenting consistently with what you've told them already about yourself. You need to know your application materials inside and out. Every single bullet point, every single sentence, you need to have a minute or two to say about every single thing there because if I were to go to your resume and point to that thing that you put on your resume from 12 years ago where you said you did research on that thing, well, I can very easily just sit there and say, oh, tell me about that. Right, so you don't want to be caught off guard with, oh, well, that was 12 years ago. I'm not, I don't really remember the context of it. You told me about it. You should know about it. So make sure you go through everything you've submitted, have a minute or two to say about every single thing. Make sure you do your research. Prepare about the person that you're meeting with, if they've given you the names of the people. Try to look up people in their firm, different people and partners and lawyers and uh, different students who are there. Do more than just Googling them. Do more than just Googling what their motto is. Again, they're trying to see fit. They're trying to see if you know if you're one of our people, if you can become part of our team. So you need to know what their team is like to say, look, all of the people at your firm do all these extracurriculars. These are exactly the types of extracurriculars I look for in my personal life, which is why I think I'd be a great fit for you. Practice. You need to practice. And law students are great at thinking about problems and thinking about their answers. Law students are not so great about communicating some of that sometimes. So make sure you practice these things, make sure you practice out loud. It helps with your nerves. It helps with sounding uncertain. It helps with it being more eloquent. And make sure you practice out loud. This is like the most important thing. Um, there are going to be times where there are questions that you could not possibly have prepared for. And so you want to be able um, to recognize how to build a coherent answer. And you can only do that by practicing speaking out loud because in mock interviews that I run all the time, I identify specifically to students. I can tell when you're unsure because you play with your wedding ring or you tug at your hair or you make a face or you, you know, squint your eyes. Like, these are things that lawyers are looking for. These are things that judges are looking for. And you can be sure these are things that hiring managers are looking at too. Can I tell when this person doesn't know what they're talking about or is making something up? Almost always yes. So really practice it in front of a camera, practice it in person, practice it out loud where you can so that you can identify, oh, that's what I do when I'm nervous or that's what I do when I'm not sure. Um, and then prepare sort of based on the format that you've been told or that you know uh, you're expecting. So behavioral based questions. How do you handle um, certain situations, whether it's past or hypothetical? It might be framed as, I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation and tell me what you would do in that situation. Or it might be, tell me about a past experience where you've had these. The best way first to prepare for these is Going back to what I said before, have a minute or two to say about everything you've ever done. Think about the types of questions that they're likely to be asking, right? Behavioral-based questions are about how you would respond to a situation. So they're looking to see, as a law student, what skills do you have to deal with situations that might come up? And very typical scenarios are things like um, overlapping timelines, conflicting personalities, dealing with difficult people or difficult clients, dealing with being a follower or being a leader of a project, right? These are things that we've all had experience in, whether it's school or extracurriculars or our personal life or at work or at school. And so you just want to think back as you go through your past and go through all your experiences. Can I think at to a time when I worked in a team? Can I think to a time when I've disagreed with someone so that these situations can come up really fresh uh, once you're being asked these questions. And ultimately, think about the skill or ability they're trying to ask you about.
So if it's, you know, tell me a time where you've disagreed with somebody. Well, they're trying to see if you were in sort of a confrontation or dealing with someone who's really difficult, they're trying to see what skills you have to problem solve that because maybe they're thinking about specific clients that they're going to have the student work on. Maybe they're thinking about the caseload that they have against a specific law firm that they know is particularly antagonistic. Maybe they're going to assign you that legal assistant who always works with law students, but who clearly hates law students and doesn't like dealing with them. And so how are you going to deal with a legal assistant who's not going to like you very much? Right, so you always want to think, what is the skill they're asking me about and do I have any experiences I can draw from? The best way to answer behavioral based interviews is the STAR approach. So STAR stands for situation, task, action, and result. Describe the situation that you were in really quickly. Name the specific task or challenge that relates to the question that you were asked. The most important part is the action. Describe the actions and the steps you took to accomplish that task. And finally, the result is very important as well. How did it resolve? So for example, if the question was, tell me a time when you've had a really difficult interpersonal, uh, uh, interpersonal interaction, a bad answer would be, Oh, well, I had a best friend in high school who uh, we had a disagreement over this thing and we just stopped talking and we've never talked again. You can see how I haven't told you anything about what caused that situation, but I specifically in my action have told you I avoided that person and now am no longer continuing to deal with them. The result ultimately is a negative result. So think about what are the steps you could have taken to properly solve that problem to result to a resolution that might come off being able to show maybe a communication skill that you have, right? You know, I should have engaged with that person in further dialogue or um, your understanding of different personalities. It's clear that we were different personality types and I know now when I'm dealing with somebody like that what I should do going forward. All right, so be authentic in your answer, but always think the most important part of the answer is the A and the R because that tells me what do you do when you're dealt with that situation and what are the steps you take to problem solve that problem. A good star answer lasts about a minute or two so try not to go longer than that because you will start losing people's attention, unfortunately. Um, but give enough background so that people understand the hypothetical that you're working through or the past experience that you're trying to work through. Um, so this is an example, right? Describe a situation where you were faced with a mistake and explain how you resolved it. So this isn't a hypothetical. This is go back to an experience that you've had. And again, everyone has made a mistake at some point. A bad answer would be, oh, I've never made a mistake. Well, one, that's not true. And two, there's no ability to tell me how you problem solve. So an example here would be like, oh, in this course, we had to uh, re do some legal research or prepare a memoranda. Um, and I realized in uh, the in dealing with um, the memo and the partner I was working with that I had missed a leading case in that research. And so the mistake was missing the leading case. What was the action I took? Well, I immediately called my partner and explained. We research, uh, we discussed the research trail to make sure we understand why we missed that case. We thoroughly uh, ensured to canvas the research and then I completed the portion of my uh, of the research and revised our memo. Right, clear, definite steps to address the specific situation. And here it shows multiple skills, right? Communication, owning up to a mistake, and knowing how to rectify it. And ultimately, the result, right? The, it took a lot of extra work, but we would make sure we still met our deadline, even though I made that mistake. So you can see, it's not just telling an employer what you think they want to hear, 
because ultimately they just want to know how would you problem solve? And again, the inauthentic answer would be, oh, I never make, make mistakes or I'm always perfect. No one's ever perfect. Um, and so again, it's just inauthentic to think that that would be a good answer. Um, during the interview itself, so there's, I, especially now that everything's online, I find that students always think, oh, I'm just going to prepare like a set list of answers that I'm going to like read out as I go through it. Right? I'm going to prepare why I want to be a lawyer. I'm going to prepare why I like this law firm. I'm going to write a script about all these people that I've done research on. It makes you sound like a robot. Interviews are about talking and communicating and having a dialogue with someone. And if you've prepared a very detailed verbatim script that you expect to go through, one, you're no longer trying to connect with the person, you're trying to read your notes. And two, it makes you sound very robotic. And again, from the point of view of an employer, do I want to work with someone who's that robotic or is not able to react extemporaneously to situations and to dialogue that's happening? Make sure you're actively listening, right? Are the lawyers or the student committee or the hiring recruitment people mentioning things that you can bring up later or that you can follow up on? Again, it's about a dialogue and having a discussion. Maintaining eye contact is super important and very difficult in uh, today's day and age. The simple trick, look into the camera. There's this tendency that everyone has, and I've been doing it even during this meeting, is to look at yourself, right? Look at your own thing and see how you're looking at. All it takes is looking directly into the camera, right? Look directly into the camera, smile directly into the camera, and people will feel like that you're looking at them. Very simple to do, stop looking at yourself. <laughs> I, like it's so it's such a natural inclination for all of us to do it for the hour of the interview or the 20 minutes of the interview try not to do that smile make sure you are because again if you were in person you'd be able to connect directly with every single person and smile to them you can't do that so connect to your camera and smile at your camera if you can um, and then some cam etiquette, right? If you know there's a lot of busyness going on in the background, maybe put up a virtual background. Make sure you're in a quiet room. Make sure you don't have that many distractions. If you have pets or kids, try to make sure they're not in the room at the same time as you if you can. Um, every interview is going to have a section of, do you have any questions for us? Always have questions for them it is still a part of the interview. Do you have any questions for us? Isn't, the interview is over now. Is there anything we need to deal with before you go? It's an opportunity for you to show your knowledge about the firm, the passion you have for the area of law they deal with, the values that they have. And it's an opportunity for you to show, I'm so interested in this firm and I do have more questions about you. So it is 100% still a part of this interview. Um, I'm not going to tell you what questions to ask because you're all then going to ask exactly the same questions and it's going to be incredibly awkward for every interviewer. But one thing that you need to know is people can talk about themselves really well. People can talk about their experiences really well. People can give advice to you about their situation or how they perceive your situation really well. And so think to those subjective questions that that interviewer can maybe speak more in depth about rather than just things that you could have looked up yourself. Make sure your questions are not something you could have just found on their website. I talk to student recruiters all the time where they say, you know, in the interview, the student asked me about our rotation. Well, the entire rotation schedule and everything is on the website. And so it just goes to show how little research that person might have done. Um, this is a common question uh, and don't feel embarrassed for uh, wanting to know because again, a lot of you come from different cultures and different countries. Is it okay to ask how much they pay? 
Um, do your research. Much of the firms out there will have that information published already, or they'll say something like it's competitive across, you know, it's competitive to firms of equal size. And again, you'll be able to find that research out there. Um, however, if, if you are curious and you haven't been able to find any of that information, that's a discussion for later on. That's a discussion for maybe a second interview or if they're actually going to offer you a position. It's at that time that hopefully they bring it up and you can then ask your questions then. Don't ask it in that initial interview. And, um, you know, how many people are you interviewing is, you know, a question that I hear from students all the time because they want to know what the chance of success is. What are my chances? Is it one in 50 people? Is it one in 100 people? It doesn't matter. You're advocating for yourself. You want to be the best you in every interview. It doesn't matter if there's two other people. It doesn't matter if there's 100 other people because that doesn't affect how you present to them. So it's not about a one in however many chance. It's this is your opportunity to impress upon them why you are a good fit for them and do your best to advocate for yourself doing that. After the interview, send a short email. Thank the interviewers, but also take notes on your interview. What did I talk to them about? What was I happy with that interview about? What did I learn about their firm? What would I have done differently? This is going to help you going forward because you're going to then be able to maybe um, do better in a future interview. Or if you run into people at a networking event, you're going to be able to break up that information really quickly. So remember, this is an opportunity to continue to build your professional network. Even if that interview didn't go your way, even if you, they didn't uh, give you an offer, you might have made a really nice connection with one of your interviewers follow up in that way. Um, in normal circumstances and normal non-COVID life, there might be um, events or dinners or cocktail hours or cocktail parties that you get invited to, especially at the MAG. It's unfortunate for both Priscilla and Nwongo. Usually the MAG has a very lovely articling reception um, that no longer is existing for this year. But there are often like social dinners or parties or events that are a part of the recruitment process remember that's still a part of the interview they're still looking to see in those social events are you connecting with people are you talking to people from our firm are you really trying to engage with us or are you really awkward do you not know how to hold your alcohol are you really messy when you're eating because that's going to affect whether or not you see any of our corporate clients right so everything is still a part of the interview don't discount anything that uh, might be coming up. Um, and so if you remember nothing else from my presentation, hopefully, you know, these are just like generic tips to think about. Know the employer. Prepare for the interview that um, you're going to come into. Is it substantive? Is it uh, interpersonal? Am I going to have to talk about myself? Am I going to have to talk about that organization? Know your experience. Be confident. Practice. Um, dress professionally, even if you're at home, even if you're uh, just uh, in a cam situation, because again, you're going to be on cam for a lot of things for work. Um, have your own questions, be ready and arrive early. Um, so, you know, be ready for those Zoom or Skype calls. Silence is okay. Um, one of the things that I find, especially with international students, is as soon as they ask the question, you want to get right into your answer. It's fine to take a breath. It's fine to think about what your answer is going to be. Don't just pummel right into, I need to fill in the gaps of silence with an answer right away. It's, oh, that's a really interesting question. And take your pause, take a breath before getting into your answer. And always just thank people. Thank people for the opportunity. Thank people uh, for, you know, the opportunity to meet with them and to interview with them. And be thankful to yourself. You have this experience under your belt now, and hopefully it's going to help you going forward. Um, so I'm going to leave it to, you know, uh, the rest of the team, and then hopefully I can answer some of your questions later.
Thank you very much, Michael. Now I'm going to pass it to Yongo so she can talk about her experience during the article recruitment with the government. Thank you so much, Priscilla, for having me. Thank you, Michael. That was very informative. And um, Michael has actually said a couple of things that are on my slide, so I'll try not to repeat um, a number of things. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Okay, awesome. So, um, I'll be speaking about my experience articling with, uh, actually, I'll be speaking about my articling interview experience with the Ontario Public Service, and I hope that um, whatever I have to say will be helpful to you. So the OPS interview process actually presents opportunities for you to demonstrate your experience, your skills, your knowledge and background in order to establish that you are the best candidate for the position, right? So I'll just go right into the slides and hopefully you find it helpful. Um, so before the interview, there are a couple of things that actually helped me a lot. And I believe that if you um, practice one or two of them, it will be very helpful. The first thing I had was I had a research worksheet. So basically, you need to know about the government, its structure, its mission, its values, current priorities, activities, interests, its agencies, the selection process for the articling position the job qualification and specifications. Basically everything I just mentioned is important. And knowing all these things will provide guidance on what you should expect on the day of your interview. And um, the second thing I'd like to mention is be aware or be reminded that the OPS assessment can take the form of um, interviews. You can have work-related tests. You can have technical tests. You can have presentations, you can be given work samples or a combination of three or four of them. So personally, I was asked to um, make a five minutes presentation on the role of the attorney general. So back to what Michael said, most of the questions are basically to test whether or not you know about the government, right? So I was asked to make a five minutes presentation on the role of the attorney general. I also had the interview as well. And then I had some work related tests and a couple of them actually bordered on professional responsibility. So um, you want to take note of the fact that you can have a variety of um, assessments. Um, I don't know what your questions are going to look like, but um, one thing I know is there are some resources that were actually very helpful for me and uh, I have them on the slide. Feel free to write them down or take a screenshot. Um, on the OPS website in particular, you will see details pertaining to all the things I mentioned earlier, from the values, the structures in the government, the mission to, you know, every, every, every single thing is important. The, the resume writing guides are there as well. Um, you would find some interview tips on that website. So you definitely want to visit the OPS website if you will be interviewing with the government. And the information there will be of so much help to you. When you're faced with questions such as describe a diverse and inclusive organization, why do you want to article with us, what practice areas are you interested in, how would you describe the role of the premier, for example, or the role of the attorney general, you know, when you're faced with this kind of questions, you won't be stuck because you've actually gone to do your research on the OPS website. You will know the mission, you will know the values. Very important, take note of the values of the OPS, take note of the mission statements. You actually want to weave the value, there are about eight values, you want to weave them into your answers as you go along, it's very important. Again, you can learn a lot about the government by going on the Ontario.ca website as well. And uh, there's, there's current issues, priorities, what the government is currently into, all of that on that website, just click on government and you'd um, see that information. Another thing I'd like to mention in terms of resources is if you'd like to speak with an articling student, and I suggest you do, if you're interviewing with the ministry, it's good to um, meet people, right? Especially current articling students in that particular ministry that you'd be going into. So I suggest you go on the website, um, the, you, you go on the on the employee and organization directory the link is there to it to take, it to take you directly there um yeah type if you know the names of the articling students put put the names in 
um, feel free to send them an email or call them. But um, the route I took actually was to go on LinkedIn and um, messaged a couple of articling students that I found on LinkedIn and then set up meetings, set up calls that way. That's how I did it, right? So you can also go on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is another helpful resource for uh, meeting with people. There are a couple of people out there that are rooting for you. Meet with them and please learn from them. They know or have access to information that may not be on the website or on any of those links I've provided. Another thing I'd say is go on the ministry's website and learn about the ministry. Again, I can't stress this enough. You're actually, the, the, the import of this interview is to, is to discover whether or not you know about the government, whether you know about the ministry, right? So you want to go on the ministry's website and learn as much as possible about that ministry. They have information targeted to their projects, their current priorities as well. So click on that link and then, um, yeah, get to yourself updated. That would be very helpful. Again, click on the link to review the ministry's publications. The link is there, publications.gov. You want to also um, go on news sources, read up on newspaper articles. I'd recommend um, Ontario.ca, news.ontario.ca. You will have a lot of current um, affairs over there as well. So this, these are resources that actually helped me. So you want to take note of them. They may be helpful to you as well. And the next thing I'll mention is before the interview, and I, I think Michael has already touched on this extensively, is that don't skim over the job ad, right? Carefully review because questions will most likely be drawn from the, the, the ad. So anticipate um, questions. Michael has already listed them. General questions. We have general questions during the interview process as well. And these questions would border on your work history, your skills, your knowledge. You'd also have job specific questions or technical questions. Like I mentioned before, um, what is the role of the attorney general? What is the role of the premier? You'd be asked um, behavioral or competency based questions. You'd be asked situational, that's hypothetical or problem solving questions. And um, there are quite a number of popular questions that do appear in diverse ways. For example, tell us about yourself. Why are you interested in working with the government? Tell us about your previous roles. For instance, I personally was asked to mention things I had achieved in my previous roles. You might be asked questions such as, how does the position you are interviewing for supports the overall ministry or branch objectives. So if you don't know the ministry or the branch's objectives, that might be a difficult one, right? So again, you want to go on the ministry's websites. You want to go on all those um, websites I mentioned earlier on and do your research. It will be very helpful. If the job ad requires, for instance, Microsoft Excel skills, you might be given financial data and asked to forecast the budget. You know. Um, if the job ad mentions something about drafting skills, and these are just examples I came up with. Um, if the job ad mentions something, something about drafting skills, you may be given information and instructed to write like a briefing note. So basically a briefing note is like a cheat sheet, um, a summary of important information to update a decision maker on an issue. So you really want to do your research about the government or the ministry you're going into before you get there. You might also be asked to complete a presentation or a role play within the interview, right? So you, you, want, to, you want to take note of those four, four categories of questions that may come your way. Now, the next point is answer chart. So this may not be ideal for everyone, but it really helped me. Um, I had an answer chart where I put down anticipated questions, answers to the anticipated questions. You want to avoid scripts. Like Michael said, you don't want to be reading off of a script or anything like that. But um, I had answers to the anticipated questions. And what was really, 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 really helpful for me, I can't stress this enough, is I had my comprehensive work experience as well as part of that chart. So above and beyond what is on your resume, right? You have useful experience that you can pull from to answer questions. You might not be able to anticipate all the questions. You might not be able to put down all the, the sample answers. But one thing that will help is if you have a comprehensive list of your experiences, you know, the, the, the roles that you performed, you know, they're down to the details, right? It really helped me 
in the interview because you know when you ask a question that you didn't prepare for at least what's in your mind what's fresh in your mind is your experience so basically develop an inventory of skills experiences and job related attributes that you can use to market yourself specifically to that ministry many people incorrectly assume that they know themselves right and therefore they do not sufficiently prepare so i really found that anticipation anticipated questions and answers helpful and i encourage you to do so as well focus on what you have accomplished when you're making that chart right think about how your qualifications relate to the requirements of that position and um yeah that 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 i believe would be very helpful and the next point is have a support system this is probably one of the most underrated and neglected interview tip out there you need a support system that can keep you motivated when things get tough or when you're overwhelmed they're also there to help you practice 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 like michael said you need to practice out loud and i'll just add if you have a friend or two practice with people as well because um, then you can get feedback on whether your responses were clear and to the point, whether you were focused, whether the example you used related to the question, all of that will help to improve your overall preparation. So you want to take note of that as well. Now for the government interview, you will most likely have a panel of two or three members who will be writing for the most part of the interview. So don't be worried about the fact that they don't make eye contact with you often or give you an opportunity to do so. Michael has given us a wonderful tip tonight. Um, just look straight into the camera. But if you don't see them looking up, don't be concerned. If they don't smile at you at all, it doesn't mean that they dislike you or they dislike your answers. If they smile at you, don't get too comfortable and forget to be polite, right? So focus on speaking. That's what I'm trying to say. Focus on speaking and answering your questions clearly and concisely. That's very, very important. And um, for answering questions, you will be rated, now in government interviews, you'll be rated based on the answers you provide to the questions, solely on the questions, solely on the answers you provide to the questions. Right, so keep speaking, even when the panel is write, writing, focus on speaking. And um, I, I remember that in my interview, I had two interviews, one with the city and one with the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services and Ministry of Infrastructure where I am currently. And um, the city had about two substantive questions. So in the course of the oral interview, I was given the substantive questions and given time to prepare there right in front of the panel. And then I presented on those um, those questions. And one thing that helped me um, is the IRAC format, the issue, the rule, the application, and conclusion. That's what I used in you know answering my facts-based question. And then um, for answering my general specific behavioral and situational questions, I focused on the PAR format. That's the problem, action, and result. I found it very helpful because again, this guides you to avoid telling stories remember you want to spend your time answering the questions not telling stories it's very easy for us to you know get carried away when we are explaining our um, um our previous roles or you know so you really want to follow these guidelines right and um i'd also add that there are a few competencies that should be demonstrated in your answers when you're interviewing with the government um, competences like um, problem solving skills, very important, leadership skills, customer service skills, team spirit, a drive to deliver results. And you want to make sure that you weave in your technical skills as well. And something that's very important to the ministry, even right now, not, not of recent, but it has been there for a while, is diversity and inclusion. So you want to make sure that all these um, values find um, their way into your answers. And then again, ask questions michael has already touched on this so i won't stress on it too much you'll be given an opportunity to ask questions so take advantage of that opportunity don't ask obvious questions like michael said if 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 the questions you're about to ask could be found um, in the course of diligent research whether it's on the website or links then you don't want to ask those questions except you're seeking clarifications on issues that um, you probably missed and then you don't want to ask redundant questions or questions that seem to compare the organization with another or questions that highlight the weaknesses of the organization. 
right so those are things you want to take note of be be very polite when you're asking the questions of course throughout the interview you want to be polite you want to be confident as well let your confidence flow through your presentation you know and uh, as you're answering the questions as well and um i think i'll i'll, I'll follow what michael said i, I won't i won't mention any exact any sample questions because we don't want everybody asking the same questions right but one thing i'll say is focus on questions that show that you're interested in the organization sincerely interested in the organization questions that show you're interested in the growth and development of the organization questions that show that you're interested in your own growth and development as well and finally after the interview i can't stress this rest 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 rest, rest. write down the questions you were asked then proceed to eat sleep watch a movie take a walk listen to music by all means please rest you know we have we have a tendency to beat ourselves down when we have a grammatical error or we feel like we didn't answer a question properly um you need to rest as well and then um you you can prepare for the next interview for those of you that have more than one that way you're refreshed you're ready to review the questions you're, you're ready to review what you can do better in the next interview and i think i'll end by saying um what is meant for you will come to you if you don't stop giving your best wherever you are currently. I remember that in 2018, I made no less than 70 applications for articling student positions and I, didn't, I, did, I did not receive any rejection emails, not even a rejection email. So it have been better than the silence I got. I had nothing from any of the firms or organization, but it was in 2019 that I applied to, I think about 10, it wasn't more than 10 firms, including the government and the city and i got two calls from the city and from the government and then i'm currently working with the ministry of government and consumer services and ministry of infrastructure so what is meant for you will come to you don't give up keep going and thank you so much for listening enjoy the rest of the evening i'll take any questions if there's any question for me thank you thank you very much for that i second everything you said <laughs> So I'm going to, I got some questions through the email and also through the chat, and I'm going to start asking them and redirecting to, and you can both feel free to jump in, whoever thinks better. So the first one is, considering the pandemic, we know that the firms usually have law firms activities like dinners, cocktails, like Michael message. How do you think that is going to be happening now? Are they going to be doing something virtual? Like, do you have any idea? So most of the firm recruiters and the big firms, multinational firms, have pretty much said that everything's going to be virtual. They've tried very hard to make sure people are still engaged and all of their student members feel like they're part of the team. Um, I was just mentioning Priscilla as uh, and Wongo was speaking. The Law Society actually had a meeting of their convocation today. Um, and in the agenda of convocation, they've specifically recommended that all firms hold interviews and interview recruitment events virtually. So the recommendation from the LSO directly for the 2021 to 2022 recruit is that everything be done remotely if possible. Thank you for that. Uh, another thing is, um, is it unusual practice? That's more for you, Ongo. Uh, is it unusual practice for the government not to give candidates time to review the questions when they're doing their interview or do they get time to review the questions before the answer? So I think it's unusual if you're not given time, you will always be given time. So I was given um, 15 minutes before I went into the oral interview to prepare for the topic I was going to present on, which was the role of the attorney general. So you, you will be given time to prepare, right? And if you need more time in the course of the interview, like Michael said, don't be shy. Don't be afraid of silence. Don't be afraid to take out time to think. Don't be afraid to ask for, you know, to ask to come back to that question if you're not sure of what to say. It's better to plan than to say something off point, right? Yeah, yeah it's better to be, to be eloquent than to try to just say something to exactly. fill silence. Exactly. I will also say that different ministries, different government offices mm -hmm. will have different practices. So mm -hmm. like Nwango was saying, like I mentioned, some will get require a presentation, some might right. be case scenarios, some might be oral questions, some might be technical questions. So it really will just depend on the ministry. Yeah, when I did my interviews, I had uh, multiple ways too. I had some questions, I had some that I did have like five minutes to prepare, like before answering. I also had to prepare a case in advance. So it really depends on the instructions you get. 
So the next one is related to behavior questions. So when we're talking to behavior questions, do the interviewers take the different approach towards a candidate that have more experience in another jurisdiction as compared to students that are fresh out of law school? So like when you have to talk about concrete examples of experiences that you faced in your career, are you expected to also say that if you just finished law school and don't really have an, a long career? I mean, my biggest suggestion for that is as you're going through your own experience, it doesn't matter how much experience you've had. It's what's the best example of that skill I've showcased. And as somebody with more experience, you've probably had many times where different issues have come up or conflicts or, um, you know, time management issues. And as somebody who's more experienced, maybe draw on the more complex complicated things that you've had experience in because that's going to show how impressive your problem solving skills are as compared to somebody who is just straight out of law school. Um, so it's not that they'll treat you differently. It's that you have an opportunity to impress on them that that experience you have makes you a better problem solver. That's yeah. good. And uh, this other candidate, she's uh, doing the Manitoba recruitment and she's doing the Manitoba licensing process. So she's asking, when you're doing the interviews, if it's okay to ask or request at the end of the interview, if they would consider starting articling before the licensing term, like so here in Toronto before August 2021. I think that really depends on the firm. Um, the larger the firm, the more structured their recruitment process is. And you have to be mindful of, again, because the size of the firm, they might already have students who are in the last um, cycle who are finishing off or some are students who overlap. You have to remember that when a firm is hiring students, it's not because they know students need to get licensed. It's, there's a bunch of work that needs to be done that they can't bill an associate for. So it has to be billed at the student level. And so, they're a business and their work is determined based on how much work they have and how much their need is. So you'll have to figure out if that firm, do they currently have students? Is there a structured process in place where they're cycling through students, through summer students and articling students? If you realize that it's not, and if you realize they are experiencing a lot of work, certainly it's open to you to have that discussion with them to say like I know you're really busy now you know I'm open to any opportunities to starting earlier the only things that you need to also be mindful of is are you in that licensing cycle or not starting earlier is fine if you're eligible to article starting earlier is not fine if you're not eligible to article at the time that they want you to start. So that's a situation that actually happened to me where I did an interview for the regular recruit and my offer was actually for the year after, but they were really busy at the time and they just had an opening at the student level that they're interested in. And they're the ones who told me, it, because you've got your certificate of qualification, would you like to start a year earlier? And thankfully, I was ready to do so, and so I did. Um, but it really just it will depend on the firm and the work that they have and whether or not you're comfortable having that discussion with them. And uh, the next one is about government interviews. Uh, would it also be negative to have a script for a government interviews which are less conversational and more structured? So I think Yongo can answer that. I think she already did, but I just wanted to add something. I feel like if you were talking about behavioral questions, it's never good to have a script. Like you should try to be yourself and you should try to not improvise, but you should try to be as authentic and like natural as possible because they don't want to be talking to robots. When you go to court, they don't want you to be a robot as well. So that's also what they're trying to see. When you have to prepare a case, and you have to have a case in advance and you have to prepare, I don't know, 10 minutes on that, then it's different. Of course, you're going to be structured. You're going to have the point one, point two, point three, and you're going to like start to give an introduction and then you might be asked questions and have to jump to the end. So they expect you to sound like more structured, but like the behavioral questions, I would say prepare as much as you can, but don't memorize your answers. I don't know if the other panelists have something to say. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just stress on it again. Avoid scripts as much as possible. 
what will really help um, is just have that organizational chat with your experience, make it as detailed as possible and refresh your mind of your roles and things that happened in those roles, because then it will be more natural. It won't be like you're acting, right? They want it to be natural. So yeah, I mean, again, I would just stress, you know, scripts make you sound unnatural and it right. actually takes you out of the conversation because again, you're, you might be reading it or you might be trying to memorize it as opposed to trying to really connect with a person. Um, one of the things that I find problematic with scripts also is people think I'm going to use that example for time management. Mm. However, if that was like a group work that you were really tight on time, maybe that could also apply on a question about being a member of a team. Mm -hmm. And if you, stick so rigidly to the fact that but that scenario is only for that and you haven't thought about how it might else apply if the question comes up and you don't have like an immediate script prepared for that kind of situation you're going to find yourself struggling so that's why i always say you know like nguango said as well have either like a table of your experiences or even just go through your experiences in detail and think about it. What can I use that as an example of? Problem solving, communication, time management, conflict resolution, interpersonal skills, because I'm sure all of those factored into a whole bunch of different scenarios that you've experienced. If I may just add Priscilla very quickly. Um, and if you're wondering, oh, but I don't have enough legal experience, I just have a couple of experience working as a camp manager or with um, McDonald's or whatever. You can pull from those experiences as well. The key is what's the experience that best fits that question? What's the experience that best fits that scenario? And you want to be confident about it. Be proud of your experience, whatever it is. Even if it was an international experience, own it, be proud of it and say it, right? That's it. I was just ask the other questions that I have. Any new questions I won't be able to because of the time. But uh, so for you, Yolongo, did you do anything different when you wrote your 10 applications instead of just 70 applications that made you get um, the interviews? <laughs> yes, I think it definitely helped to narrow my choices because then you can do a lot more research. Because remember, I've given you a bunch of resources on the government alone. And if you were to go into all those links, you will find sublinks and sub, 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 sub links. So it's impossible for you to be well prepared, you know, even on your cover letter or your resume, it's impossible for you to be well targeted to the companies and organizations if you're just spreading it everywhere. But if you target like 10 organizations and do a proper research, chances are at least two will call you back. So yeah, I think that helped. That's good. Okay. I'll write it down. Yeah. Watch our last video. I did a whole thing on resume and cover letters and yeah. it was, I said exactly that, right? Yeah. You can spend five minutes on a hundred applications or you can spend an hour on eight applications each, right? So, you know, prioritize what you can. Right. Yep. So the other question is, uh, if they ask about the mistakes that they have done, it's okay to bring an example from school instead of work? Absolutely. But again, make sure there's an action and a result at the end. It's not, I made a mistake and I just left it and that's the end of that, right? I know what I did wrong or I knew what I should have done or this is how I would fix it going forward. And the last question is, uh, do you find that a LLM is an advantage for an international student? And if you would recommend it, maybe for your own book, because she's a student, or she was. <laughs> yes, I actually found it very helpful. The international experience, meeting students, you know, speaking with professors and not to talk about the wealth of experience that Osgood gives you in each of the courses. I found it very helpful. And um, even in um, articling with the government as well, I've been able to pull on some of the resources I had. I will never forget my legal research and writing course in Osgood. So it's really helpful. I'm still working, you know, pulling from that experience. So definitely, if you can get an LLM from Osgood, do it. This is not advert for Osgood, by the way. So. <laughs> I would just say that um, the one the one downside I find with a lot of internationally trained lawyers is they think if I do another degree or if I do another course, mm. I'm going to show them I'm passionate. 
And that's not necessarily true, right? You're all nerds. You all have two, three, four degrees already. And so doing another course or another degree doesn't show me more than what you're already showing me. But if you figured out what your narrative is, if you figured out what you're passionate about and that LLM or that course or that certificate is going to help you become a better version of yourself, then 100% do that. But don't be in this mindset of, oh, I'm going to do another course because it's going to show I'm interested or I'm going to do another degree because that's going to show them that I'm really smart. You're all smart. You all have multiple degrees. You're all fairly intelligent. If I needed you to do a legal research memo, all of you could do it. So don't just bank on the skills that you already have that don't distinguish you. Okay. It was going to be the last question, but that one's very important. Like this person has a bar exam the same day of the interview. Uh, is it okay for her to say that if she noticed that the interview was taken a bit longer than it should have? I think 100% yes. Um, I mean, the employers should be well aware of that. Um, it's weird for the bar exam to be on the same day as the interview. Um, but, you know, you also have to prioritize what's more important to you at this point. Do I defer the exam or do I ask them potentially to defer the interview? Um, it's, it's really, it's, you're going to have to feel that out yourself. I find it strange that they would schedule it on the same day unless it's from a different, different jurisdiction and they're not aware of that. Yeah, so we're done. I'm just going to ask, answer one question here that they ask uh, how to find out about our, the ITL and CA future events and webinars. So currently we don't have an email list. We will have it shortly and you all know about that. So the best way to know about our events is to follow us on social media. Like I am the communications director and I'm always making sure that I get the word out there for you all. Uh, we have an Instagram account, we have a LinkedIn account, we have a Facebook account, we also have a Twitter account, so, and we have a website. So as long as you follow us on all those uh, platforms, you will not miss it out because I also share to the stories of Instagram. So when you're like browsing stories and late at night and tired, you'll be able to find our events. So just make sure you follow us. And uh, for now, that's it. Thank you very much you both for coming and sharing all your knowledge with us. I really liked the session. I'm pretty sure it was very useful for the students. And thank you everyone. They're going to be interviewing on November 2nd, 3rd and 4th. We really hope that you get a position and that you get your dream position and that you're happy next year. And uh, whoever comes to the government, I will see you there. So thank all you. Best. Yeah, all the best. Yeah. And have a good night.